this is a somewhat different type of projects than, than others uh, that you have heard here or will hear in many of the other sessions, since it involves no empirical investigations and no uh, development of literacy education tools. Rather, the purpose was uh, purely to explore what other fields have thought over the past about financial behavior and to gather from there insights that might inform financial literacy education, particularly uh, towards the vulnerable population. So the review that I'm uh, going to be able to give in this session will be very quick and very short, uh, but you do have a brief on, on all the uh, papers that, uh, that were done for uh, the consortium uh, in your packet, including a, a practitioner's brief for this, and, and our pa uh, the longer paper is on online. Uh, what we did was we uh, looked at uh, five main areas of social behavior theory, developmental psychology, three areas that in this paper we titled the measurement of behavior, and the literature that argues for a distinct uh, culture of poverty. Um, it might seem odd, but I want to start out by suggesting two other uh, readings. Um, for, uh, for those in this audience. The first one uh, we do refer to quite frequently in, in the paper, uh, and it, uh, is, I recommend its reading uh, for insights into how behavioral um, psychology has been and uh, integrated into our thinking about uh, behavioral economics. Uh, it might seem curious that economics, which really is a behavioral science, um, fundamentally concerned for its history with individuals' uh, savings and consumption decision, seemed to struggle to incorporate behavioral psychology into its theory, uh, struggling with whether it uh, invalidated theory or how it could be modified, and I think we have come to the latter conclusion. Uh, Melissa Knoll's paper is uh, in the very recent, the most recent uh, bulletin, uh, Social Security bulletin, uh, obviously too late to be incorporated into our paper, uh, but she really is an excellent uh, overview of behavioral economics literature with quite detailed suggestions about its applications to saving strategies. So I recommend that for everybody in this, uh, this room to, to read. And therefore, I'll probably uh, not emphasize uh, behavioral economics as much as I would have otherwise. Uh, where this, uh, partly where the financial literacy uh, field starts is in thinking, uh, as, ex as expressed in this quote by uh, George Akeloff and Robert Schiller in an excellent book called Animal, Animal Spirits, which contrasts the view of the traditional view of economic man and the view I think a lot of us in financial literacy would like uh, people uh, to be uh, in terms of they, uh, people who weigh all their options, they carefully look at the probabilities, and they, and they choose the most advantageous option. Uh, instead, it has been observed by everybody, including you know, personally and, and among friends and, and clients that you have, that indeed many financial decisions are made because of emotional feelings, uh, either that emotions lead to decisions um, that may or may not be beneficial, or that decisions are made in order to make one feel, emo uh, feel better, but not necessarily financially better, that there's an emotional uh, component uh, to that. Uh, much of the decision, discussion in financial education is about informational impediments to making better financial decisions. And this actually comes from Melissa's paper, an accounting of what happens, uh, what decisions are made, how decisions are made in the absence of, of full information or uh, when the choices are very uh, complex. But uh, information is not the only impediment. Uh, that individuals face on the path to weighing financial alternatives. Emotions play an important role. And the second definition of emotions on this slide hints at some of the most interesting work that I think is going on in financial behavior. How being confronted with financial decisions may actually cause changes in your body and uh, brain uh, that lead to responses. So it's not just emotional, it, you know, even incomplete information uh, being presented or educating people. There are things that are happening in their body and their brain. For a surprisingly long time, at least to me, um, behavioral theorists um, have, um, have talked about 
uh, people's responses and relationships to money. Long before behavioral issues explicitly entered the economics mainstream, the field of psychology grappled with individuals' attitudes towards and behavior involving money and consumption. Their views of the, uh, what I found most interesting was their views of the causes of behavior uh, among the early psychoanalysts, including Sigmund Freud, uh, w developed from their observations about people's behavior uh, and attitudes towards money. Uh, some individuals were stingy and greedy, while others were generous. And they saw this in their money, monetary behavior, and Sigmund Freud's theory partly developed uh, from what they saw were people's uh, attitudes towards money. Psychoanalysts saw uh, financial behavior as reflecting a conflict between inherent desires for more of it and the social norms that may be violated in the pursuit of money. Fiscal responsibility traits, they argued, developed out of the manner in which this conflict was resolved in early childhood. So psychoanalysts propose sequential life stages that individuals progress through working out stage-specific conflicts. Whether they got the stages right or matched correctly the conflicts is not the important issue. But what is important is that they inserted that the influence of early childhood rearing experiences on behavior and personality traits including, included those related to money. They identified parents as playing a key role through the attitudes they expressed about behavior we would all agree are important to financial con conduct, fear versus security, acceptance versus rejection, and power versus powerlessness. Psychosocial theory, its origins credit to Eric Erickson, redefined the stages through which personality developed and explicitly considered the role of social, cultural, and historical forces on behavior and attitudes towards money. They talked about many of the conflicts that we, we see in financial life. The development of trust versus mistrust, autonomy versus shame, initiative versus guilt, industry versus inferiority, identity versus role confusion, intimacy versus isolation, generativity versus self-absorption, and integrity versus despair. Skinner's work is some of the most widely known among learning theorists. An important assertion of Skinner for financial literacy, I think, is his argument that positive reinforcements and punishments are not equal. They don't have equal effects, with reinforcements providing much longer lasting results, and negative uh, or punishment, in fact, having uh, un unexpected uh, negative uh, side effects. Skinner argued that a punishment should include punish positive reinforcements, so individuals receive a signal about how to behave, as well as how not to. So you, couldn't, you needed to combine the positive and the negative. Skinner also noted the importance of time to award or punishment, arguing that a lapse of even a few seconds affects the association between behavior and consequence. This attention to time led Skinner to argue that by breaking large tasks into separate skills that can be performed in sequence and reinforced, an individual will be better able to learn complex behavior such as paying down debts, to pay off your little debts first and make it a sequence. Cognitive theory associated most often with Piaget was interested in the cognitive processes that went on between a stimulus and a behavior. He was convinced, and this is very relevant to, to the games, that in order to, and I quote, to know objects, the subject must act upon them and therefore transform them. He must displace, connect, combine, take part, and reassemble them. Simple explanations are not enough to change behavior. So here we can draw a, uh, a parallel between fi interactive financial uh, 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 education and not. In the paper, we reviewed three areas that we describe as the measurement of intelligence or behavior, areas that have contributed to a greater understanding of how individuals learn and how information is used. The first of these originates in psychology, where early efforts to measure behavior uh, intelligence uh, we're most successful in measuring children's intelligence, but they found that, they, that intelligence, including our IQ what measures, were, uh, were less successful as uh, predictive uh, measures, and, and they, they were inconsistent measures in measuring adult intelligence. And so out of this came the sense that you should not have a single metric uh, for measuring more complex intelligence. Also a sense that there were different kinds of intelligences that developed uh, differently over time. 
And most recently, there's been uh, quite a bit written on what's called fluid and crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence being shaped by life experience that directly affect the structure of the brain and how it responds to stimuli. And the second, crystallized intelligence, which develops primarily over time from education and a culturalization. So we include um, behavioral um, economics in this session, but I imagine I'm running short of time. Uh, you, you have about three minutes. Okay, and so I won't, you'll be hearing a lot about behavioral economics in these sessions, and I refer you to Melissa Knoll's paper. Um, and, uh, uh, and so what I want to do is, is lead, uh, move to what I, I think is one of the more exciting areas of, of, uh, of phys uh, financial uh, research. Um, that, the, and that is the research that is taking uh, advantage of developments in medical technology, uh, which has allowed us to open that black box in here uh, and see what is actually happening. So in the paper, we describe brain studies that support the importance of emotions in guiding and biasing the decision-making process, especially in cases of uncertain outcomes. Specific areas of the brain have been identified as important to assessing risk and guiding behavior based upon the anticipation of those consequences, with brain activity greater during high-risk decision-making than during low-risk decision-making. And, the, and you can see that it takes part in, a place in different parts of the brain. The same areas are also differently activated when subjects evaluate the fairness of offers. These stu a study like that would seem to support behavioral economists' argument that the sense of fairness matters in decision making, that something goes on in your brain uh, to evaluate fairness and to play a role in the decision making. With the additional, uh, with, and so that many, much, much of this reaction may be partly automatic responses than merely conscious, rational behavior, uh, thinking. The final area we review in this paper is the culture of poverty literature for both its insights into financial decision making and what it might imply about financial literacy education to a financially vulnerable group. Usually culture applies to a group of people that share ethnicity, geography, or generation. The persistence of high poverty rates among so, some social and demographic groups has extended the concept of culture to shared socioeconomic status. The traits associated with a culture of poverty are categorized into the attitudes, values, and character structure of the individual, the nature of the family, the nature of the community, and the relationship between the culture and larger society. I don't want to get into the argument of whether there is indeed a culture of poverty, but I think a lot of the environmental issues that, they, that is discussed um, are important uh, for insights into uh, people's attitudes uh, towards uh, financial, financial issues. So what are the implications for financial security education that we draw from this review? What consistency might be there be in these different literature's views of financial behavior? Arguably, I think the major contribution of psychoanalysis is the strong link between childhood experiences and adult financial behavior. The focus on raising children and the development of behaviors that may not be specific to financial literacy uh, and attitudes at very young ages that become unconscious lifelong character traits in adulthood implies the importance by all of us to the attention to educating parents of young children and teaching them how to educate their children. Psychoanalysis had a great deal to say about the desire for pleasure and immediate gratification, again developing their theory from observable behaviors, are talking about the choice of immediate pleasure over long-term gains, which has puzzled psychologists, behavioral economists, and financial literacy educators uh, more recently. Uh, and this has also been a central theme to the culture of poverty literature, and now is a topic of brain research. Psychosocial theory contributed a view of developmental conflicts, and I'll just uh, skip ahead since I only have a minute. Um, attempts to measure intelligence have demonstrated the complexity of intelligence, that there, you know, there's a lot going on in the, on our brain, and neuroeconomics offers researchers a new way of looking at the decision-making process, potentially providing insight into differences across individuals in their physical response to financial incentives, uh, including by individuals raised in different environments. Uh, whether there's a culture of poverty is not the issue. 
Um, but I think it's important, as I said, uh, to pay some attention to the behaviors that, um, that these scholars uh, identify as more prevalent in certain communities, uh, which imply some of the challenges that might be faced in, uh, and, and particular approaches that may have to be taken in, uh, in educating uh, certain uh, in, uh, low income populations. So some very quick conclusions. Uh, financial education is not just about information, but must include an understanding of how inf information may be pro processed and processed differently based on early experiences that may have shaped brain structure and therefore its response to financial stimuli. Financial edu education from all these fields would imply that it, sh uh, it, it should begin early and be developmentally pr appropriate. Financial education must acknowledge the importance of prior knowledge to how new information is interpreted and must acknowledge that there may be subconscious brain processes that are going on that are not easily uh, informed uh, of, or countered by information alone. Um, that there may be values and fears that the brain itself responds to, uh, to, to physically and uh, that the brain indeed may require a sequencing of stimuli in order uh, to, uh, to, to, to successfully incorporate um, information into later behavior. And as I said, uh, all of these fields um, uh, emphasize the importance of childhood development experiences. Finally, I just want to say we all may be behavioral, uh, uh, behavioral economists believing in the power of rational choice, but must recognize choices are constrained by a large variety of factors, some stemming from early childhood experiences and family and community values. Many of these factors I think that we've talked, we talk about, I, f I find interesting, were talked about for many years by early psychologists uh, and now but are being formalized in our thinking about financial behavior. So indeed, uh, we should all be drawing from the fields of psychology, economics, neurology, and other fields which have been grappling with this for uh, over 100 years. 